our next uh, uh, speaker uh, from uh, HIT, Dr. Katerina Seidensal, who is going to talk about osteosarcoma. Uh, thank you. You can uh, share your screen if you wish. If there are any problems, we will share the presentation. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. I want to talk today about the role of uh, protons and, of course, of carbonines um, and uh, the therapy in, uh, of osteosarcoma and the experience um, that we have gained and hit in the recent years. Um, first of all, a couple of introductory slides on the topic of osteosarcoma. Osteosarcoma is a quite a rare condition. It's only 1% of all newly diagnosed um, cancers. Um, are constituted by osteosarcoma, and even in childhood cancers, it's only 3%. Um, still, especially under the age of 20, it is the most common primary bone tumor, and it arises at two, um, uh, it has two peaks in the age distribution. The first one is around the age of 13 to 16, and the second one is around the age of 65 or above the age of 65. Um, there are several risk factors for osteosarcoma, mainly it's genetic conditions. Approximately 20% of patients with osteosarcoma have an underlying genetic condition. So um, a thorough family um, uh, history, in detailed family history of um, uh, cancer diseases and also, of course, genetic counseling and testing should be anticipated in, in uh, the cases of osteosarcoma. Um, the main genetic conditions are hereditary regional blastoma, of course, Lee-Fraumini syndrome, but it's not only genetic conditions. Osteosarcoma also constitutes um, um, the most common secondary malignancy after radiotherapy or also after chemotherapy. It's approximately 3% of all osteosarcomas, and this is also a very complicated condition um, to treat. Um, at the age of um, above 65 years, um, Paget's disease um, is one factor contributing um, uh, to osteosarcoma. Here you can see the histologic classification of osteosarcoma as um, uh, um, proposed by the WHO 2020 um, classification. You see that the most common type of osteosarcoma is the conventional osteosarcoma. It's uh, more than 90% of cases, which is um, also divided into the subgroups osteoblastic, chondroblastic, and fibroblastic. And this is the most of the cases that we will talk today is um, um, under the group conventional high-grade osteosarcoma. Um, uh, the other uh, group that we will talk today is the craniofacial osteosarcoma. And uh, in the course of this presentation, I will give you additional information on that. One has to take in mind that osteosarcoma has no specific immune stains or molecular tests in contrast to other sarcoma um, types because there's no characteristic immunoprofile or uh, chromosomal um, um, translocation. Chemotherapy plays a crucial role in the management of osteosarcoma um, of the high-grade types because with the introduction of chemotherapy, the uh, management of osteosarcoma has lead, led to uh, dramatically improved um, um, rates of uh, survival. Before chemotherapy, um, um, 80 to 90 percent um, of patients who have been treated with surgery only would develop metastasis. Um, even if there were staged without metastasis at the initial diagnosis, which has led to the hypothesis that there is some subclinical not visible um, disease at the time of first diagnosis that cannot be recognized on MR scans or on CT. So before that, the historic um, long-term survival of osteosarcoma patients was 16%, and with the introduction of chemotherapy, it in, um, has increased to approximately 70%. Um, the most common um, protocol, chemotherapy protocol used by our institution and many others is the standard arm of the um, Euromos 1 protocol. It's um, mainly applied for patients that are under the age of 40, and it constitutes um, of uh, metotrexate, doxorubicin, and cisplatin. It's a free substance chemotherapy regime. Above the age of 40, it's typically um, doxor the combination of doxorubicin and cisplatin without the metotrexate. Um, the surgical response assessment uh, is um, associated as like one demo one of the most important prognostic factors, meaning that at the time of surgery after the neoadjuvant chemotherapy, um, 
the um, 90 percent of tumor necrosis, uh, meaning that there are less than 10 percent of vital tumor cells is associated with, uh, with an increased prognosis. Here you see the typically applied treatment regimen um, with um, chemotherapy starting at week 10 and continued up to week uh, at week one and continued up to week 10, then surgery at week 11, and then um, continuing surgery uh, chemotherapy one week after surgery up to week 29. Um, the tumor location um, the tumor location differs with the age of the patient. Typically, the younger patients, uh, also those that um, have the first diagnosis of osteosarcoma at the time of rapid bone growth at the age of 13 to 16, for example, um, they have the classical tumor location at the metaphysis of long bones around the knee. So it's the distal femur and the proximal tibia. Um, another location of the extremities um, are proximal humerus or middle and proximal femur, but those are not the locations that we want to talk today about. Today we want to talk about the more complicated axial tumors, tumors that are located um, in the craniofacial region or in the pelvis. Um, when you go into textbooks for med students, you will still find the sentence, which um, I highlighted here, um, copying it from Ambas, uh, which says osteosarcomas are typically uh, resistant to radiation therapy. And if you go into the current guidelines, like for example, the ASMO guidelines, you will find the sentence, new radiation techniques may extend indication or could be considered, which means that we are still at a low level of evidence. But with the next slice, I want to show you why there are selected cases where you should consider um, carbonine or a proton therapy, whichever is available. First, I want to show you the um, trial that we had um, um, conducted here at Heidelberg, which is, was called the OSCAR trial, the um, osteosarcoma carbon ion radiotherapy trial. It was an um, early phase trial, phase two trial, um, which was um, conducted to determine safety and um, efficacy of a heavy iron radiotherapy in patients with, with inoperable high-grade osteosarcoma, having the typical secondary endpoints, local control progressions, free survival, overall survival, but also some kind of substitute for the response assessment that you typically have with uh, the surgery where we um, tr um, chose the FDG PET scan to have some type of response assessment in those that do not go for surgery. Um, it was uh, planned to be initially planned to be a carbon ion only trial, but um, the federal agency for radiation protection had some concerns about uh, carbon ion only trial um, at a time. It started in 2011 at a time when there was little knowledge about carbon ion therapy in, in the pediatric um, cohorts. So they suggested to have a combination of a carbon ion boost um, with a proton plan. And this is how this, uh, this regime was designed. It is a proton main pl plan uh, with um, 54 gray RBE and 27 fractions, uh, followed by a carbon ion boost of 18 gray RBE in um, six fractions. And what you see here as a plan of this, I showed you that the first to 10 weeks, it's near advanced chemotherapy. And the um, radiotherapy was here chosen as a substitute for surgery for those that were not amenable to surgery. But it also means that we have a longer gap of chemotherapy free time. Um, this is this is part of this regime and the chemotherapy continues then continues then not in week 12 but in week 18 overall. Um, this is the OSCAR trial study population for this rare disease. It took a while to um, create a, or to enroll the patient cohort starting in 2011 and continuing 2018. We included overall 20 um, patients. They were all treated at our single center, but they were referred um, from several countries in the U in Europe. You see it uh, in the end, it um, was an, uh, a, a European project uh, treated at a single center here. We enrolled patients um, above the age of six and with an adequate performance scale and um, of course, adequate blood cell count. Um, you see that the median age of these patients was 20 years. Um, patients um, were had uh, the typical distribution with a slightly more males than females. And we had six patients with a craniofacial localization and 14 patients with a pelvic localization. Um, the 
target volumes for the boost planet was 415 milliliters and for the base planet was um, 1041 milliliters. You see that this cohorts, because this indication is quite rare, typically tend to be heterogeneous. We had primary and recurrent tumors, we had patients with metastasis, and um, also patients that had initial surgery or biopsy. Um, most of the patients um, got the chemotherapy regime um, from Humerus 1, but still um, we accepted patients with our regimens that were standard uh, of treatment at the referring institution. Um, our primary endpoint was toxicity, and what you can see here, I know this is a slide with a lot of information, but um, what you can see here is the acute toxicity for the pelvic region and for the craniofacial region, and we did not observe much acute toxicity in the level of grade 3 and no toxicity grade 4. The most common toxicity was radiodermatitis and hyperpigmentation in the acute phase in the pelvic region and mucositis additionally in the craniofacial facial region. Um, when we checked for late toxicity, um, we saw that um, we had also quite um, acceptable rates of uh, grade 3 um, toxicity um, and grade 4 toxicity. We saw one case of secondary malignancy in a recurrent um, pelvic osteosarcoma. The patient had an acute leukemia um, a couple of months after the end of radiotherapy, and she was treated two years before that, um, uh, according to the Euromus 1 protocol. And the other high-grade toxicity was hearing impairment of a patient who already had bilateral autosclerosis, and we could not keep to the constraint of the ipsilateral um, uh, cochlea, which uh, led to the deterioration of hearing. Um, we also checked for um, the blood marrow production by checking the platelets, hemoglobin, and also leukocyte count, and we saw that this type of irradiation, even if it's uh, um, those are big volumes that are treated, that does not really influence the um, the values of um, of uh, uh, the checked uh, the checked values. Um, when we checked into the secondary endpoints, um, we had a median follow-up of um, approximately 34 months, and we saw that the overall survival at uh, two years was um, approximately um, uh, it was 68 uh, percent, and we saw a quite significant difference between the locations, between the craniofacial location and the pelvic location, with the cranial loca um, fa um, facial location having improved local control and progression-free survival. Um, here you see also the subgroup analysis, and as um, um, shown also by others, volume is um, um, prognostic factor with small, uh, smaller volumes being uh, have, showing improved prognosis. The craniofacial allocation is a um, prognostic factor in our cohort, and also the FDG uptake. And what we saw is basically that all of the patients had an increased FDG uptake, and we um, created with the um, uh, with our colleagues from um, for, who performed the POT scans, we created a score which was in relation to the liver uptake, and we saw that those that had um, an increased uptake to the liver uptake, but not the double liver uptake, had um, a better prognosis. This is what is shown here with um, score four and score five. So. Um, here you can see a couple of uh, clinical cases um, for the craniofacial localization and for the pelvic localization. What you see is the MRI before radiotherapy, the initial PET scan, this is the um, um, boost plan dose distribution, MRI after radiotherapy and the PET after radiotherapy. But you see, what you see is um, that those tumors after radiotherapy still show some residual tumor mass, which seems to be a kind of inactivated, biologically inactivated residual tumor mass, probably high rate of fibrosis in this region, but there's still some measurable lesion. Um, um, this is also one reason why rhesus does not easily apply in those conditions even after effective treatment, even after long-term uh, control. And I showed you that the, in the pelvic region, we have um, an impaired uh, results uh, complete, compared to the craniofacial region, but still there are also long-term survivals. This example here is an example um, of a patient that was treated at HIT um, in the year 2016. This is a patient um, from Vienna, which was lost um, to follow up after some time of 
with our institution. But um, uh, last year, we were informed by the treating oncologist who called us who referred a new patient that uh, this patient had uh, last year a child even a ch child a healthy um, I think it was a healthy son this is um, a second example this was the first patient treated in the Oscar trial you see this was also before we had um, um, the gantry running uh, with horizontal beam plans and you see that also in this case, here you have the treatment planning, MRI, and also um, PET scan, um, the boost plan and um, the primary plan. And this is an MRI seven years after radiotherapy. And you see that there's still a measurable residual region without any treatment, without progression seven years after radiotherapy. This is something that has to be considered and also clearly communicated to, to uh, the referring doctors after treatment. So as we saw that craniofacial osteosarcoma has, um, has uh, better survival in our small cohort, we wanted to see if this results also apply to the bigger cohort of our institution. And we checked uh, retrospectively for this data. Um, for that, before I introduce you to, to um, show you the results, I would like to introduce you this small sub-cohort of osteosarcoma. Um, craniofacial osteosarcoma is considered to be a distinct variant. Uh, median ages, they are older, um, the median age is 36 years old compared to extremity osteosarcoma. And they are described to have um, more indolent cores, but there are also some um, high-grade variants and um, high-grade um, disease in this cohort. Um, because it's uh, typically difficult to perform, perform um, margin negative surgery, there's a higher tendency for local um, recurrence with this disease. Um, local recurrence can arise in, after, in surgical series up to 50, in up to 50% of cases. Those um, patients have less distant metastasis um, at um, initial diagnosis and also during the course of the disease, but still in series, especially for those that have no clear margin um, resection. Um, the five-year overall survival is um, 40%, and those recurrences that can occur here typically are considered to be lethal because um, um, salvage uh, surgery after recurrence is um, only uh, curative in only a small amount of cases. The most common primary sites are the mandibular and the maxilla, but also infiltration of the extragnatic bones um, of the skull base or the orbit, as you see here in um, this example, um, uh, occurs in, uh, in some portion of cases. And about 10% of osteosarcoma cases are um, craniofacial osteosarcoma because um, probably because um, the of the lower rate of distant metastasis, the role of chemotherapy is less evident. There are retrospective um, um, uh, series that are in favor or against chemotherapy, but still these days it's considered that if you have a high grade osteosarcoma, it should be treated in parallel to extremity, the extremity variants. So when we checked um, for our retrospective cohorts um, treated here at Heidelberg, we found overall 49 patients. Um, and we saw that 17 patients of those were treated after the initiation of um, the OSCAR trial um, with proteins and carbonines. And of these, six are from the initial OSCAR trial. So it's 11 additional patients in this sub-cohort. Um, the, in the other concepts that you see here on the survival curves, curves we had several patients with secondary osteosarcoma, for example, after radiotherapy for retinoblastoma. We had um, um, carbon ion only patients, often all patients of older age without additional chemotherapy. And from the very beginnings of HIT, there was also some uh, there were also some cases of a combination of a carbon ion blue boost plus IOMRT. And what we saw is that especially the combination um, with this really structured protocol and uh, regular implementation of chemotherapy led to um, significantly improved survival. This is this curve here. The very top curve you see here, it was proteins only. It, it, um, these are three pediatric patients after um, an incomplete um, a resection by, with microscopic disease that were treated with proteins only. So um, when we checked into the cohorts um, and tried to see um, um, what are the favorable factors, we identified the first one was age. Then 
treatment at first diagnosis in comparison to a recurrence divided the curves um, significantly. Um, no macroscopic residual disease and the planning um, um, uh, uh, MRI or CT was also one factor um, that divided the curves and uh, showed a prognostically um, uh, uh, important and also additional chemotherapy, which was used in these case mostly um, according to the standard arm of the Euromos one protocol. So um, this is uh, this. Those are the publications from the recent years that we have for um, osteosarcoma. But I want, of course, to show you also the publications from our colleagues. Um, this is one more more recent um, publication from um, the um, Japanese colleagues who looked into pediatric inoperable pediatric osteosarcoma overall 26 patients. Here you see mostly pelvic localization with a median age of 16 years and median follow-up of 32 months. And you see that here um, the overall survival after five years was 42% and the um, five-year local control was 60%. Um, uh, so you see also here for a really desperate situation that chemotherapy, um, the results here are really dismal. You can achieve um, um, progression-free survival prolonging, also overall survival um, improvement for those patients. A um, little bit older publication from 2012 um, had um, 78 patients overall, 61 were located in the pelvic region, and here a median dose um, of 70.4 gray was given in six infractions over four weeks. Um, uh, this is the same regimen um, as was applied in the, um, uh, in the study that uh, I have presented on the last slide. Here was a minimum follow-up um, uh, for the patients was 14 months. And um, what these colleagues um, reported for this cohort was a five-year overall survival of 33% and a local control of 60%. Um, uh, really in parallel to the results that um, we saw in our cohorts was that approximately 500 milliliters um, of tumor volumes um, was a prognostic factor. And you see here local control, but also overall survival were um, significantly better for those with the smaller tumors. Um, here I want to show you one publication from 2011. It's from the U.S. centers um, of 55 uh, patients with a median follow-up medium follow-up of 27 months, um, also older age than the typical, 29 years. Um, the distribution of the locations here is different. It's more craniofacial tumors than pelvic tumors in this um, cohort, and also those that had a gro grossly resected, um, meaning um, microscopic positive resection, um, the, the rates were higher than in the other cohorts of um, 43%. Um, here, it was not a, the hyperfractionation, but mainly normal fractionation um, that was used, um, and the mean dose was slightly lower with 68.4 gray or gray RBE, protons and photons were combined here. And um, interestingly, um, the local control overall survival were quite um, good in this cohort, but the rate of grade three and four toxicity was uh, um, higher than in the other cohorts that I have presented to you. In contrast to what we saw in um, our study, the cranial localization here was associated with a higher risk of local recurrence, um, which might be also attributed to the different uh, median dose concepts. Um, what you see here is an overview um, of all of these trials. It's really difficult to compare these trials because um, it's a really rare indication. And as it's a rare indication, the cohorts differ. Um, there is uh, some heterogeneity um, regarding not only the cohort size, um, the modality, but also the dose concept, the fractionation, the locations, but also the inclusion of metastatic disease um, of secondary osteosarcoma. But overall, one can see that um, that even if uh, inoperable osteosarcoma is a really, really prognostic difficult disease, and um, in uh, selected cases, you can here achieve an improvement of oral survival and also of, of prognosis um, uh, of, of PFS for those patients. Um, there 
are not only different dose concepts, but of course also different um, concepts for target volume delineation. I just want to show you how um, we um, um, uh, work here at the HIT. We use um, the uh, for the high risk CTV, which is the carbon ion boost, typically a CTV margin of seven millimeters, and for the low risk CTV, which is the proton. Uh, primary or main plan, we um, use a um, margin of two centimeters, which um, is um, also including the initial pre-chemotherapy or when um, the patient had surgery pre-operation um, extension of, uh, the, um, of the tumor formation. Here you see one of those targets volumes. You see um, that um, this is a uh, maxillary um, a tumor which infiltrates um, into the area of skull base um, uh, and why it uh, was um, defined as inoperable. And what you also can see here is that we typically use tongue depressors to spur the sp um, surface of the tongue from, um, from uh, toxicity and mucositis. They are um, for this condition, publications out there, very nice publications for custom-made tongue devices for use for prudence on carbon ions. You see here that depression of the tongue, um, as also shown here, an example from our um, institution, um, can move you uh, can move the tongue out of the high dose area and also um, quite helpful for target um, volume delineation in this region. And there are also um, devices that are not only depressing the tongue, but can also um, displace the tongue to the side of the, for target volumes as this and lead to a reduction of acute toxicity, meaning mucositis. There are different systems out there. Here you can see the system that we use here um, with the dentist from our institution. Another toxicity or another um, risk organ that one has to think of when irradiating um, uh, craniofacial osteosarcomas is um, CNS radiation necrosis. Here you see a publication, it's um, a bit old, from my colleague Ingmar Schlamp from 2011. It was for um, carbon ion radiotherapy of um, clivus cordoma. Um, you see here that with increasing dose that is applied um, and with increasing volume, you have a um, um, steep increase of the probability of contrast enhancement in the brain tissue. Um, it's difficult to apply one individual, one single constraint to every patient because the tumor sizes um, are very different from patient to patient, but still this is something that has really to be taken in mind. And um, with this one, I want to show you an example of a patient we have treated in 2019, still um, uh, in uh, control, but um, um, it was an extensive tumor here of the skull base infiltrating the clivus, infiltrating the petrous bone. You see here, it's a little bit difficult to show the whole extension of the tumor on only one slide, but I think the dose distribution shows you also how extensive this tumor was. And since um, I think in 2011, it was that the patient developed here in the cerebellum, um, uh, the radiation necrosis that we then treated with um, first with dexamethasone, but then also with several cycles of um, avastine to control it and to, to reduce the according system, um, symptoms. Um, on this slide, I want to show you the, one of the patients with pelvic osteosarcoma and the according target volume uh, delineation for the boost and for the base plan. And um, also, here you can see that the, um, those patients have to be monitored closely and also adaptation of uh, is uh, certainly something one has to think about when treating those type of tumors. What you see here is the planning CT. It was a little bit easier to see on CT. Um, so this is why I chosen that um, treatment planning CT and week three after treatment. And what you see that in this uh, region, the tumor has um, uh, regressed, uh, has uh, responded to treatment, and the, mus um, the psoas muscle, which was displaced here, is moving back into position, which allows also um, for the small bowel to move back and um, um, results in a uh, small bowel um, moving into the high-risk uh, CTV. We typically um, adapt these patients when we see anatomical changes, and what we do is performing regular CTs, but also MRIs. Um, especially in the pelvic um, location. Um, there are nice publications out there, and which I want also to show you in this context. Um, it was early phase data and also sm a small 
patient population from um, the colleagues from Japan who used um, a spacer, a bioabsorbable spacer, which they developed for this type of um, condition, which can be implanted between the tumor and the risk organ, um, especially the small bowel or the rectum. And this displacement by the spacer um, yields in um, better um, a sparing of this, which you can see here with, for the rectum without the spacer and with the spacer, um, and also yielding in a um, better CTV coverage. As the spacer is de degraded by the body, you see here, um, this is the spacer before initiation of radiotherapy and then the up to, um, then the how, how it changes and is degraded by the body five months after the end of proton therapy. It's an um, uh, early phase data that I found here. It's nothing that we implement um, here at HID, but still a very, very interesting to see in which direction this will um, go in the future. So with the this last slice, I would like to um, finish the presentation and um, to conclude from our experience and also, for, of course, from the experience of others, is that in selected indications, especially in the inoperable situation, particle therapy is a promising alternative. Um, that especially for high-grade sarcoma, aiming for multimodal therapy, including systemic therapy, um, is uh, uh, something that we uh, typically approve of. In those patients who had an incomplete microscopic resection, um, we would um, um, always consider radiotherapy because sometimes we are presented to patients after, especially in the craniofacial localization with uh, the third, fourth or fifth recurrence, which is <clears throat> really difficult uh, to treat. Um, and um, especially for the craniofacial localization, we see on um, superior overall survival and local control. For the pelvic localization, um, overall survival and um, progression fee survival, I think it's prolongation, but there's also um, one portion of those uh, patients that have, can achieve long-term control um, with uh, also really good uh, quality of life um, from our experience. So. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present um, this data, and um, I'm uh, happy to hear your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, this was uh, a really very uh, good overview of uh, the cases. Difficult uh, job uh, you have. <laughs> so let's see now uh, the questions. Uh, so the first question is, what makes osteosarcoma resistant to radiotherapy? Um, so in our cohorts, I told you, we saw patients that responded uh, well to, um, to radiotherapy, but others did not, especially for the pelvic localization. So far, we cannot really identify which patients are really the ones that respond well. Um, I saw, showed you the cases of, for example, those two patients that are on in local control for a long period of time, the patient from France and the patient from Vienna, who are also in, con in uh, close contact from now, uh, from, from time to time with us, um, reporting us also the uh, quality of life that we ha that they had. Um, we cannot identify the groups, so we cannot really tell what's the exact, um, the, ex the, the patient that really ha will have this uh, ongoing uh, control there. Um, in regards to pelvis and craniofacial, what we know is that craniofacial um, tumors um, um, have a kind of distinct biology. It's also maybe one thing of um, the ossification of, of embryology that the craniofacial bone has a, a different type of development. So maybe this is one reason why they respond differently, the craniofacial region and the pelvic region. In the pelvis, of course, also the volumes differ. We have really extensive volumes and giving a high dose there is really difficult overall um, because it's in so close location to, to critical risk organs. So maybe additional dose escalation or giving a radio sensitizer in parallel um, is something that should be tested in future, but the pelvic localization remains a really critical localization. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, if you have any other questions, please raise hand. 
Oh, I don't see a raise hand. Uh, actually, yes, there is this uh, poll. If you can uh, please uh, answer it, this is important uh, for us for statistics. In the meantime, uh, coming back to your uh, presentation, I was quite surprised uh, with uh, the statements uh, in the medical books. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, so uh, indeed, uh, particularly in Heidelberg, uh, you are treating, I think, the, since uh, 2009, if I remember correctly, and is uh, already a long time. Uh, and I know that uh, a lot of, uh, I mean, you are a university hospital, mm -hmm. right? A lot of uh, the doctors are a university the professors as well. Uh, do you have a comment uh, there? And um, in fact, uh, this is why we have organized this uh, school as well. No, This uh, school gives the opportunity uh, to update uh, the young generation in particular and um, also professionals that they have no such experience. But uh, yes, if you can have a comment on that, because I'm surprised in Germany to have uh, such a, um, a delay, let's say, no? It's, uh, I was, um, when I prepared this presentation, I, I, I thought of my time uh, as a student and I thought maybe, let's check, is it still in there? Because the sentence is something that I remember from this time. And in, indeed it's still, yes. The, I think the main reason, but the rare indication or the problem with the rare indication, um, you saw that for 20 patients in the OSCAR trial, the patients came from different countries in, in Europe. So the problem with the rare indications is really to have um, um, evidence, a high level of evidence and creating also trials that can really improve the level of evidence. It's changing slowly in the um, guidelines. We have the national guidelines, we have also the European guidelines, and you see that there gradually um, um, particle therapy is mentioned. It's uh, saying it could be, um, uh, so it's uh, still, these formulations always um, offer or, or show a lower level of evidence. Um, could or may, it's a typical formulation that used these days. I think this is something that will um, evolve slowly, but um, 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 there are clearly cases, it's uh, small cohorts, of course, heterogeneous cohorts, but there are clearly cases where uh, we sh have shown and others have shown that osteosarcoma is a disease when treated with an adequate dose, um, adequate um, uh, type of radiation therapy, and I think carbon ions and protons is uh, really the future to go there, um, is I think this will be uh, evolving in future and there will be a bigger role in this situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And uh, this uh, brings me to another comment uh, that uh, it's related also to the previous uh, pre uh, presentation. Um, somehow, uh, I have a, a, a mind of a physicist. I'm a heavy iron physicist, I'm not a doctor. And uh, okay, for us, it's a different world, uh, let's say. Uh, but uh, still uh, um, trying to prove uh, that uh, carbon ions are uh, better or have a better effect, uh, it's one way to go. But uh, we heard also in the previous uh, presentation that this is not the only thing uh, to uh, highlight is the quality of life and harming less the healthy tissues. And there I think uh, it is uh, indisputable. So maybe the argument has to be turned uh, in this direction because at the end is quality of life and at the end reflects uh, also in the economy. If we assume that uh, uh, conventional radiation therapy is a matter of uh, uh, less expensive, less costly and uh, things like that, uh, still one has to factor everything in. So I don't know if uh, as doctors or as a hospital or as a therapy center you are doing something along this direction. Um, yes, we today we talked only about the inoperable, but what one has to keep in mind that there are those pelvic osteosarcomas, for example, um, that are marginally operable. And at that time, when we are really are in a discussion level, when we have, have improved the evidence and uh, are discussing with the surgeons uh, um, um, about quality of life, then those cases that you be treated with radiotherapy only and that have local control, 
um, are patients that are mobile, that many of them are um, have a normal walking ability. Um, and those patients that receive, for example, hemipalvinectomy, does the, the, to draw the comparison there will only be possible when we cre increase the level of evidence further. But then it will be, I think, a very important discussion, which is the optimal treatment um, also in really regards to quality of life because um, surgery can have a lot of mobility, especially in the pelvic region. Okay, thank you very much. Since we had a little bit of uh, time and there were no other questions, I took the opportunity <laughs> to answer, to have some thank answers on these questions. Thank you for your uh, uh, presentation.